It's always an honor and a privilege um, to teach the Word of God, but I believe it's an honor and a privilege to preach the Word of God. And I just wanted to give you a little anecdote here. I've been in this church now since probably 2003 or so. And if you can believe this, tonight is my very first time preaching in this pulpit. Um, I've been doing a lot of Sunday school for, for many years. I've been back there. And it's a little different when you're back there because you expect the noise, you know. You expect the commotion. You expect people getting up and getting coffee and donuts and water and walking around and doing all of these things. But when you're up here, everyone is laser focused and just <laughs> looking at me. And I can literally feel the heat that is emanating <laughs> from your eyes and reaching me right now. So if I look like I'm sweating, that's because I am. <laughs> and I blame you guys, right? Well, let's take a look at a couple of things this evening here in the book of James. In James chapter 1, verses 12 through 16, we're going to look at something here that's really interesting, and it's something that affects each and every one of us as Christians. And that is temptation. Temptation. You see, there's, there's this misconception today that... The closer your relationship with God, the less temptation you have. Experience as a Christian and as a believer, you know this is not true. As a matter of fact, quite the opposite. The closer you are to God, the more you realize that you're being tempted. And that's not by coincidence. You see, your relationship with God will help you determine the temptations that you face and overcome on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's really important for us to understand. And that's what I'd like to focus on tonight. Just for a few minutes, I'm not going to be very long. I know the notes may be a little misleading, but we're not going to be very long with that. So what we want to do tonight is we just want to look at a variety of different methods or a variety of different steps that are going to allow us to have victory over temptation. Because if we are honest with ourselves, each and every one of us deals with temptation. And we deal with temptation on a day-to-day -day basis. The problem is, is that we don't admit it to ourselves. Because we think that for whatever reason, whether it's our spirituality or whether it's something else, that we aren't being honest with ourselves when it comes to temptations. And we need to be. If we want to be the Christians that walk with Christ then we need to be honest with ourselves when it comes to those temptations. And that's what I'd like to focus on this evening. We're going to look at seven different ways for us as Christians, as believers, to be able to overcome temptation. So let's just take a few minutes here in this passage, and we'll be looking at a couple of other passages as well, as we look about having victory over temptation. So I'm just going to run through these really fast. And you'll notice that at the end, we'll be able to pull this all together in hopefully a nice and neat fashion that you guys will be able to remember. Having victory over temptation. Number one, what is the very first thing that you do if you want to have victory over temptation? Well, as a Christian and as a believer, we need to be vigilant. Okay? We need to be vigilant. You know, as human beings, we love our stuff. Right? I remember when I was younger, I, I lived and I grew up in a corner lot house. And uh, my dad, what he would do is he would set up these lights on the corners of the, of the roof. And these lights had a sensor so that in the evening hours or at night when anybody walked by, those lights would turn on and pretty much light up the entire street. What he didn't calculate was that my bedroom window was right next to one of these lights. So in the middle of the night, I would have this flash of light that would just shine through the window. Because somebody or a cat or a dog or whatever it was that would, would walk by would just, you know, turn the light and the sensor on. Why did he do that? Well, because he was cognizant of what he owned and he valued his stuff. He valued his possessions. And he wanted to make sure nothing happened to his things. You know, when you fast forward today and you look at how much we value our stuff, we also look at the types of things we do. Just as my dad had lights with sensors, today we have video doorbells that as soon as you get close to them, they're 
recording you and they're sending messages to your phone and they're doing all of these different things. And why do we do all of these things? Well, it's because we value the things that we have. We place a tremendous amount of value on our possessions. Well, ladies and gentlemen, how much more important and valuable is our relationship with God? Right? Our relationship with God. So, if we are to be vigilant, if we are to be on guard, what exactly are, do we, are we to be on guard against? Well, the first thing that we'll notice is that we need to be consistently on guard against our flesh. Our flesh. Romans chapter 13, verse 14. Romans chapter 13, verse 14. If you want to turn to that, that's fine. If you don't, if you don't have enough time, that's okay too. I'm going to read it for you. It says, But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. We need to understand that as Christians, we need to be careful about being on guard against our flesh. You see, our flesh will take us in so many different directions, right? We know ourselves. And we need to be honest with ourselves and understand that our flesh has power and influence over each and every one of us. If we let it. We need to be on guard against our flesh. But it's not just that. I'd like to bring up something else as well. We need to be consistently on guard against Satan. Okay? We have flesh and we have Satan. But there's some very unique characteristics that I want us to look at when it comes to guarding ourselves against Satan. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says this. It says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. We've probably read that verse hundreds of times in our life. But I want us to take a look at something here with regard to that verse, and a couple of other verses as well. You see, the Bible doesn't talk about Satan just as a lion. Did you know that the Bible talks about Satan as other animals as well? We know that Satan, first and foremost, attacks as a lion. We see that here in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. We see that very clearly. Satan attacks as a lion. What are the characteristics of a lion? Well, a lion is an animal that preys on the weak, Right? It preys on the weak. Satan, as a roaring lion, is preying on the weak. The weak Christian. Christians that don't know the word of God. Christians that don't care so much about their spiritual lives. Christians that just float around on a day-to-day -day basis doing whatever it is that they want to do will succumb to the temptations that are bestowed by Satan. Because as a roaring lion, he's looking out for you. The weak. And it's not just that. You see, the Bible also talks about Satan as a serpent. Satan attacks as a serpent. Where do we see this? Well, none other than in the book of Genesis, right? In the book of Genesis, we see that. Now, what's so special about Satan attacking us as a serpent? Well, you see, if we look at the example that we see in Genesis, we see what the serpent was doing. You see, Satan, as a serpent, uses our own doubts against us. When you are unwilling to be led by Christ, when you are unwilling to be led by God, what you are telling God is that he doesn't have the power in your life to help you with whatever situation you're going through. And when you doubt God's power, guess what? Satan's got you right there. That's exactly what he looks for. He looks for us doubting God. So if Satan can attack us as a lion, and Satan can attack us as a serpent, how else can Satan attack us? Well, turn with me, if you can, really quickly to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and there's two verses here that are really important for us to understand. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 and 14. We've seen Satan attack as a lion. We've seen Satan attack as a serpent. But look at 2 Corinthians 11, verses 13 and 14. It says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel. In other words, you shouldn't be surprised by this. For Satan himself 
is transformed into an angel of light. Satan attacks as an angel of light. What does that mean? Well, that means that there are false apostles. That means that there are false teachings. And if you are not in the word of God, you will fall to those false apostles and you will fall to those false teachings. This is what it means to be vigilant. This is what it means to be careful about what's all around us, to be able to understand and discern what is right and what is wrong. And all of that happens because of the fact of our relationship with Christ. If Satan can attack us as a lion, as a serpent, or as an angel of light, we need to be vigilant. We need to be careful. These arguments that these people may have could seem legitimately correct. They could seem even logical, but they ultimately mask the truth. And that can lead to our downfall. That can lead to us falling into temptation. There's another thing that I wanted to mention. If we go back to James in our passage here, in verse 14, it says, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. One of the critical things that we need to understand in this particular passage is that it is saying that we are being drawn away of our own lusts. People in the military... When there is a military conflict, when there is a battle going on, soldiers do not just go into the battlefield empty-handed. You see, there is a lot of planning that takes place before a soldier ever hits the field. There is a lot of talking and a lot of planning and a lot of mapping and a lot of different things that happen before the soldier takes the field to do whatever it is that they need to do. Now, why is that important? Well, you see, when a soldier goes into the field, the soldier knows of their potential threats. They don't just go into a particular place and say, I have no idea what's going to happen to me today, and I just hope that it all works out in my favor because I'd like to go home with my family. Right? That doesn't happen. They know in advance because of all of the planning, all of the preparation that takes place in order for the soldier to be able to do what it is that they need to do. There is vigilance involved in the planning. That means that you and I need to be honest with ourselves when it comes to the lusts that we battle, when it comes to the temptations that we have in life. And one of the things that we should know and understand is that when we look at our own lusts and when we are honest with ourselves, all of the different temptations that come towards us can incorporate so many different things. For example, did you know that based on your particular age, you may be more tempted to do certain things than other people? Did you know that based on your gender, you may fall under certain types of temptation than others? Did you know that based on your personality, your generation, your culture, you may succumb to other temptations versus other people? All of those things matter. And as Christians, we need to be vigilant about the temptations and honest about those temptations that can come in our direction. That takes work. And that takes being honest with ourselves. So that's number one. Understand that as Christians, we need to be vigilant. Vigilant. Number two. Number two is simply this. We need to imagine the consequences. Okay? So we have this idea of being vigilant, and now we have this idea of imagining the consequences. I'm going to throw this name out and think about the kind of things that are conjured up in your mind. If I say the name Lance Armstrong, some of you are probably thinking cheater, doper. But if I were to mention the name Lance Armstrong 10 years ago, most of you would probably say hero, leader, warrior, tremendous athlete, world records, the best ever. So what changed? Somebody like a Lance Armstrong deceived himself. And not only did he deceive himself, he deceived others as well. 
And you want to know why? Because he couldn't imagine the consequences. The consequences were not real to him. All of that happened because he disregarded those consequences. Now, as Christians, praise God that we are saved from eternal punishment. Amen? Praise God for that. However, there are still consequences for things that happen while we're here on earth. In chapter 6 of the book of Galatians, Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 through 9, the word of God says this. It says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Now, many of us have probably heard that verse before, but let's know and understand that when we read a verse like that, we need to understand that our flesh can reap corruption. We need to understand that whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. In other words, while we're here on earth, there is a reaping that will happen. We need to know and understand the results and consequences of sins in our life. For example, do you know the Word of God talks a lot about sin? And not only does it talk a lot about sin, but it talks a lot about the people that commit those sins. And not only does it talk a lot about the people that commit those sins, but it talks about the process that they went through in committing those sins. And then it talks about what happens after the fact. Did you know that some of those sins changed entire generations? Oh, by the way, the very first sin changed us. Right? So don't think that your sins don't have consequences. Oh, and by the way, Sins have consequences, not just on you, right? Did you know that sin can affect other people around you? And we don't usually think about that. But sin is sin and has tremendous consequences. In the scriptures, we read a lot about so many different cases where people succumb to different sins. And you can see what those consequences are by simply reading what the scriptures say about them. For example, we have... We have passages in the scripture that talk about pride. We have passages in scripture that talk about lust, envy, wrath, anger, hatred. And all of those different examples that we see are there for us to understand and to learn from. So that we can also imagine those consequences if they were to happen to us. That's the beauty about the word of God. And we'll get to some more of that in a second. But understand that the word of God is so powerful that it gives us literally everything that we need to be able to get through this crazy life that we're living right now. Imagine the consequences. Reading the word of God and understanding the results and consequences of these types of sins are going to help us understand that these consequences are real. They're real for each and every one of us if we are not careful and succumb to those types of of temptation. So what was the first thing that we talked about? We need to be what? We need to be vigilant, right? What was number two? We need to imagine the consequences. Good. Number three. Number three is simply this. We need to cry out to God. We need to cry out to God. I'll give you the perfect example of this when we read the scriptures. In Psalms chapter 34, if you want to turn over to Psalms 34 with me really fast, I'll wait for you for this one. Psalms chapter 34, verses 1 through 6. Psalms 34, verses 1 through 6. What a great passage. I love reading this passage because it says so many different things about crying out to God and what the results are when we do so. Psalms chapter 34, verses 1 through 6. This is what it says. It says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me 
and let us exalt his name together. Here we go. Verse four. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Look at verse five. They looked unto him and were lightened and their faces were not ashamed. And verse number six is what brings it all together. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. One of the things that you need to understand and I need to understand is that our goal is to cry out to God when we are tempted and when we fail. And the only way to do that is to truly have a heart of repentance. A heart of repentance is absolutely crucial. One of the things that I love about the word of God, especially when you study the nation of Israel in general, you'll see a lot of this in the Old Testament. But whenever the nation of Israel cried out to God, God always delivered. Always delivered. We see that in the book of Judges. We see that in so many other different books in the Old Testament. God always sent the deliverer. So when we cry out to God, what are we doing? Well, we're setting the stage in our life on a day-to-day -day basis. What we need to do is we need to make sure that the first thing that we do when we get up is we cry out to God. We seek him for whatever it is that we need to get through the day. Continually throughout the day, don't forget God right? Understand that we need him, whether we're at work, whether we're at the gym, whether we're doing other things that we need to do, all of these things, we need to always remember that God has control over our lives. And even at night, before we go to bed, thank God we got through the day. Thank God everything that happened today was for a reason had a purpose, and that we can always look back to God and see how we honored and glorified him. Crying out to God is an exercise for us to let God know of his place in our lives. So there you have those three things already. I told you we'd be going pretty fast over this. Number one is, what was it? Be vigilant, be vigilant right? Number two? Okay, I heard a bunch of stuff, but I'm assuming you guys said the right thing. <laughs> Number three, right. cry out to God. All right, good. Number four. Number four is that we need to take our thoughts into captivity. Take our thoughts into captivity. Turn with me really quickly, if you can, to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And we'll look at verses 3 through 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 5. Some of you may be familiar with this passage. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and everything that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every what? Every thought to the obedience of Christ. I'd like to mention a few very important things about this point here. The first thing is that everything that we do, everything that we sense, everything that we feel begins in the mind. It begins in the mind. And I'd like to help you visualize that. How does everything beginning in the mind affect what we do on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, there's an actual path that you can follow to trace what happens in the mind to who you end up being as a person. And if we can show that on the screen, it's basically this. You see, we start with our thoughts. We start with what it is that's in our mind. Our thoughts, what it is that we think about. Did you know that our thoughts will eventually turn into desires? You see, the more you think about something, the more you desire it. And once we get to that point of desiring something, the next step that's logically after that 
would be to actually do something about it. So now that we have these desires in our mind, because they're based on our thoughts, we turn these desires into actions. Okay? Desires turn into actions. What do we do in order to get those desirable things? The more of those things that we do, those actions turn into habits. The more of those things that we end up doing turn into habits. If we spend a lot of time doing this stuff over here, that's going to eventually be what our habit is. If we do more stuff on this side, then this is what our habit is going to be. After our habits, our habits will determine our character. I'll be able to tell who you are by what you do. You've probably heard that before, right? Don't tell me, show me. That's where that expression comes from. And we need to understand that if our habits are determining our character, well, guess what? Our character is what's going to determine our destiny. And it all started way back here in the mind. You see, when we deal with temptations, if you really want to have that victory over temptation, it starts in the mind. Deal with it when they are simply thoughts. In other words, we need to take thoughts into captivity. What that means is that we deal with them immediately. Taking thoughts into captivity means dealing with them immediately. Don't wait. Don't think that if you give it some time, things will change. This is when you bring those thoughts immediately to God. That's what it means to take those thoughts, to isolate them, to separate them out and give them to God and let God deal with those thoughts. Because you, if you haven't figured it out, in your own power, are not going to be able to deal with it. You're not going to be able to win. That's when we fall. Taking those thoughts into captivity means dealing with them immediately. So we've got four down already, right? Let me start again with number one. What was number one again? Be vigilant, all right? Number two. Sure. Number three. What was number three? Cry out to God. And what was the last one that we just did? Take our thoughts into captivity. Good. Almost done. Number five. Remember the omnipresence of God. Remember the omnipresence of God. Did you know that God is here with us tonight? He is not figuratively here. He is literally here with us tonight. That is what mean, that's what it means for God to be omnipresent. When I was a little kid growing up in Sunday school, and I remember first hearing about this idea of God being omnipresent, I thought I knew what that meant. I remember sleeping in my bed at night, wondering, staring at the ceiling, looking around and saying, you know what, is God standing right there looking at me? What happens if I go to the bathroom? Is he going to follow me in there too? Right? The mind of a child. God is with us. God is omnipresent. And what does that mean? Well, in Genesis chapter 39, verses 7 through 9, I want to read something here. And this has to do with Joseph. And this is probably something that you've heard before. But I'd like to just read it to you so that you can understand a little bit about what we're saying here. Genesis chapter 39, verses 7 through 9 says this. It says, And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wotteth not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he had to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I. Neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? You see, one of the reasons why I bring this passage out is because there's three things that the word omnipresence brings out of God when we truly think about what it means. The first thing is that God sees when you sin. Did you know you look at life differently when you know God is watching? The problem is we either forget or we don't believe it sometimes. 
God sees when you sin. Not only does God see when you sin, God knows when you sin. And finally, the part that should affect us the most is that God grieves when you sin. All of these characteristics about God are so important for us to understand because he feels these things when we sin. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 3, captures everything that I just mentioned. This is what it says. And you can probably memorize this verse as I say it. This is all it says. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. And that's the verse right there. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. The question for us this evening is, do we believe it? If we did, why don't our actions show it? Why don't our lives show it? The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. So that's five already right there. We are almost there, almost at the end. What was number one again? Be vigilant, right? What was number two? Imagine the consequences. What was number three? Cry out to God. What was number four? Thoughts into a captivity, right? What was number five? Remember the omnipresence of God. I don't know. Maybe there's someone in here that can figure out where we're going with this. Not yet. If not, it'll all come, it'll all come to head in a second. Number six. Number six is simply this. We need to run. We need to run from temptation. And not only run from temptation, but as you'll see in a second, we need to run from the temptation to the scriptures. Okay? This is not just about running in some random direction, hoping that you can run away from the temptation and outrun it. No. No. There is an actual direction that you need to go when you run away from the temptation. And that is, you run towards the scriptures. You run towards the word of God. Proverbs chapter 4 verse 15 says this, Avoid it, pass not by it, turn from it, and pass away. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 22, Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So we don't just run away from temptation into any random direction. We run to the word of God. Psalms chapter 119, 11. You probably have this verse memorized. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. We run to the word of God. And it doesn't stop there. You see, running to the word of God is not enough. That's the first step, of course, and that's a very important and critical step. But when we run to the word of God, we take that next step. And what is that next step? We replace that temptation with God's words. We replace that temptation with God's words. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 20 through, 22 through 24. It says that you put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that you put on the new man. Which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. We run to the word of God so that we can put on the new man. And of course, it doesn't just end there. Remember, it is not like a one-time process. Oh, I put on the new man. Well, then I'm all set for the rest of my life. Let's do this thing. That's not how it works. The last thing that we need to understand is that we must continue to rely on God's word. Ephesians 6, 17 says, Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. One more verse here. It says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these 
things. Such beautiful words in the scripture for us to rely on because they come from God. Imagine that. Did you know that the more you read God's word, the closer you get to him? The closer you get to him, the less temptations will take a stranglehold of your life. The better the decisions will be. Number seven. And we'll finish it off. Number seven. Number seven is simply this. And perhaps this is the one that's the most crucial, the most important, especially for us as Christians, as believers. Number seven is we need to yield to the Holy Spirit. Yield to the Holy Spirit. At the end of the day, if you don't let God be God, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, if you don't let the Holy Spirit guide your walk and guide your life and allow him to do what he needs to do in your life, whether it's to identify certain temptations that are in your life or whether it's to call you out to make different decisions in your life or whether it's to change certain things that are already going on in your life, if you don't let God be God, that will never happen. You will always succumb to temptation and you will fail. Because you're doing it in your own power. You're doing it in your own strength. And you'll never win that way. Romans 8, 13. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, then ye shall what? Ye shall live. And praise God for that. Whatever this Holy Spirit tells you to do, when you cry out for that help, whatever the Holy Spirit tells you to do, if you obey that step of faith, I guarantee you, guarantee you, you will be able to overcome that temptation because of your obedience to God. Because of that obedience to God. As I mentioned, we ran through those notes really fast. We already went through seven different things that can help us overcome temptation. Let me bring it all together for you. This is probably the easiest way that you'll be able to remember everything that I just said. And if we can show that on the screen, we'll start with the letter V. Did you know that everything that I just mentioned, these seven steps, actually spell out the word victory? Letter V, we need to be vigilant. Letter I, we need to imagine the consequences. Letter C, cry out to God. Letter T, your thoughts. Take your thoughts into captivity. Letter O, remember the omnipresence of God. Letter R, run. Run from that temptation. Don't look back and let God be God. And finally, letter Y, yield to the Spirit. That's all you have to remember. The word victory. If you would like to have victory over temptation, the first thing you need to do and understand is that you need to be honest with yourself and honest with God. Nothing will change if you don't admit what those temptations are that are hurting your spiritual life and get those taken care of. It's not easy being a Christian today in this day and age. But it can be done with the Holy Spirit's working in each and every one of our lives. We can be a blessing to so many different people and watch how God can do some really amazing things in your life. Pastor Bryson sees it all the time. He sees the potential of Lighthouse Baptist Church. I see the potential of Lighthouse Baptist Church. The only thing that is missing is that we need to see the potential of Lighthouse Baptist Church. And that starts with us being honest with ourselves, making sure that we don't fall under those temptations that are hurting us every day. I praise the Lord for everything that he's been doing in my life. I praise God for being a part of this church. 
I praise God for just allowing me these very quick opportunities to just share a few things from God's word with you. And I hope it was a blessing. I hope it's something that you'll remember, the word victory. Um, I just want to finish off with this one verse here. In James chapter 1, going back to our passage, James chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let's pray tonight.